Hello everyone. Good evening. Today we are going to see some image based learning. So it is going to be the images that are going to be self descriptive. So you are going to watch those images and uh, understand the topic. So this is anatomy and it is gross anatomy of course and myself Dr. Roini welcoming you all for the session of an academy and image based learning. So here we have my introduction. So here it is my credentials. I'm a alumni from Kasturba Medical College that belongs to the Manipal Academy of Higher Education and this is located in Mangalore, Karnataka. And I also have the PhD from Savita University. I worked on the albino mice and my topic for thesis was on the wound healing properties on the diabetic mice. And this is uh, another degree, which is Diploma in Medical Transcription and MBA in Hospital Administration, which I acquired from Georgia University. And I also have worked in USA at the hospital, Rockingham Memorial Hospital, and this is located at Harrisonburg, USA. So this is my credentials. Yes, with all this, I welcome you all for this session of image-based learning. And here we start with the first one. So here you have the phrenic nerve. There is right phrenic, there is left phrenic. So phrenic nerve, you should just remember that it is from the cervical plexus. Right. So now here you have the phrenic nerve, which is from the cervical plexus, and it supplies these structures, the phrenic, the pericardium, the pleura, and the diaphragm. So remember this 3PD, okay? This is the mnemonic that you can remember for the supply of Clinic. Right. So in this picture, you can very clearly see what all it supplies. You can see the heart. You can see the diaphragm. You can also see the pleura that it supplies. All right. Now, here is some clinical significance that we can talk about. The phrenic crush or the avulsion. So now before arrival of this contemporary uh, anti-tubercular -tuber treatment, there are many other treatments like the phrenic nerve itself used to be you know crushed and then this used to create the paralysis of all those corresponding part of the diaphragm because it supplies the diaphragm and this will be able to give rest to the diseased lung and then that would also encourage healing so that was one of the methods that was used and this phrenic crush or the avulsion the, uh, the accessory phrenic nerve if it is present it should also be smashed so how cruel that would be so both the actual phrenic the original phrenic and the accessory if present both would be smashed and otherwise the sea fibers that supplies you know that carries those um, roots for this phrenic nerve will escape and diaphragm will still continue to operate and cause pain so you should remember the sensory is the phrenic nerve that's why we are talking about all this the sensory to the diaphragm is phrenic nerve All right, the next one. So here we have the next one. The congenital anomalies of the thyroid gland. Now here the thyroid gland neither develops from any of the clefts nor the arches, the pharyngeal arches, but it develops from a small, you know, um, piece of tissue that is present on the dorsum of the tongue. And that is called the thyroid tissue. So here there is a small diverticulum that, that extends beyond that point and leaves that point as a small you know, foramen that is called foramen cecum. Now the tissue goes on developing as a thyroid glossal duct. And sometimes there could also be agenesis of the thyroid gland. That is one of the congenital anomalies of the thyroid gland. Agenesis of the thyroid. So it, thyroid tissue itself is absent. Then there could also be failure of the development of the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland itself is failed to develop. And this can be, you know, giving you the commonest cause of cretinism. So cretinism, again, you know that the 
thyroid is very important endocrine gland so this could be one of the commonest cause for cretinism and there is this incomplete descent of the thyroid tissue also sometimes it may just remain on the tongue itself and that can be referred as lingual tonsil you can see that the thyroid tissue on the tongue and it is supposed to just keep a remnant or leave a remnant that is called foramen cecum all right instead of that if the entire thyroid tissue itself is present and that is known as lingual thyroid and here the descent of the thyroid tissue has not happened whenever it descends it goes as a thyroid glossal duct and it passes the thyroid bone it passes the cricoid cartilage and then it should be you know just in front of those the cricoid and the thyroid cartilage in that area but sometimes it may overshoot and also land in the sternal region so that also is a possibility so now here in this case you can see the lingual thyroid present on the dorsum of the tongue where the foramen cecum was supposed to be present all right here you have next one location of the thyroid gland if you see it is at the level of c5 to t1 so this is the level of the thyroid gland so here you can see the thyroid cartilage you can see you can see the vessel superior thyroid vessels superior thyroid artery and the vein and how closely it is related to this nerve what is this nerve this nerve is external laryngeal nerve okay so here it is and then you also have this internal jugular vein and you can also see the carotid vessels all that is carotid sheath on the lateral aspect and you can see the vessels supplying the thyroid gland very clearly and you can see the thyroid lobes are extended up to the oblique ridge that is present on the thyroid cartilage and you can also see a pyramidal lobe extending from the isthmus that is a pyramidal lobe i can mark it with the line that is a pyramidal lobe and you can also identify the the thyroid vessels there is superior thyroid there is inferior thyroid and also this is the one and you also have the middle thyroid or you can also call that as thyroidema so thyroidema vessels are also present but in this case the venous supply is very clearly given so you can see the thyroid plexus of veins okay thyroid plexus of veins you can identify they are all present within the true capsule so they are present within the true capsule so there is a false capsule there is a true capsule then comes all these plexus then comes the gland so it's always advisable to remove the thyroid gland along with the true capsule all right the next one let's see what we have here isthmus isthmus is a middle junction connecting the two lobes and that is lying against the second third fourth tracheal rings second third and fourth tracheal rings you can identify the isthmus and it is like a connector between the right and the left lobe and it is supplied by the third thyroid artery which is called the thyroidema okay thyroidema artery all right so this is the blood supply this is the location of the thyroid gland so there are so many anatomical relationships between the thyroid artery that is superior thyroid artery and external branch of super superior laryngeal nerve so you can see that the vagus gives rise to this the laryngeal nerve that is the superior laryngeal nerve and it divides into internal and the external branches there is an internal branch and a external branch and both of them you see the internal branch it supplies those membranes and those ligaments that connect the hyoid bone to the thyroid cartilage or you can also call that as thyrohyoid ligament and some mucus membrane it supplies 
But what about the external branch? External branch is very important because it is in very close association with the artery that is the superior thyroid artery. You can identify the superior thyroid artery and the external laryngeal branch. So external laryngeal branch supplies only one muscle that is a cricothyroid. So you can see cricoid to thyroid. There is a muscle cricothyroid. And since that supplies just this cricothyroid muscle, it is very important to note that it has to move medially. The nerve has to move medially. So only near the upper pole or till the upper pole, it is in very close proximity with the superior thyroid. Then later on, it moves to medially and that is left away. Okay, the artery is away. The nerve is away, then it is very easy to ligate it. So you have to remember, you should ligate the superior thyroid artery very close to the upper pole or the lobes of the thyroid gland. Okay, so that is where the nerve and the artery are away from each other. You can also see inter internal laryngeal uh, you can also see the pretracheal lymph nodes. You can see set of lymph nodes, paratracheal lymph nodes you can identify. Then you can also identify the vessels you can identify. All these are the relations of the thyroid gland. So in this particular picture, you can see the parotid gland. So parotid gland, you can identify and... Uh, in this one particularly, you can identify the sublingual, sublingual gland having a stone in within. So you can see that there is that condition is known as sialolithiasis. So sialolithiasis is a condition where the duct may be having a calcified deposit that is called sialolith or calculus. And in this case, the sublingual and submandibular glands are the ones, the ducts of these glands, like the Wharton's ducts, can have the stone. But it is a very rare condition that the parotid will have. But in this case, you can see there is the calculi picture in the sublingual gland. Okay, so that is what is blocking. And this makes the things even more worse if it is in a small baby who you know may be eating and drinking and having the suckling gum action it makes things even more worse for those babies and there could also be accessory parotid gland present around it and that also if it is present it lies on the masseter muscle between the parotid duct and the zygomatic arch so now here there are many many ducts that open from this um, accessory ducts into the parotid duct that also you can identify. So if you identify anything like this, like a white, off-white, stony structure, then you should remember it could be the calcified deposit called the calculus. Okay, now here in this parotid region, do you identify a swelling? It is not bilateral, it is unilateral and you can also see that the child has been crying. Why do you cry? When you have a pain, you cry, right? So that parotid swellings are very painful. Why do you think it is painful? It is because of the unyielding nature. Unyielding nature of? Unyielding nature of the superficial lamina. unyielding nature of superficial lamina of the parotid gland. It does not allow the skin to stretch nor that lamina would stretch and makes things very, very, you know, kind of uh, compact within the capsule. So parotid capsule is not at all yielding, especially the superficial lamina. That's what causes the pain. And you can see that the child is also crying. And there is also bacterial infection localized in the parotid gland that usually produces the abscess. So now here you can see there is swelling and that is seen in this MRI section. And infection could result from extremely poor oral hygiene also. And there is dental spread to the gland through the parotid ducts. 
So this is what has happened through the parotid ducts which open into the mouth opposite the second upper molar tooth. So this is where it opens and if the teeth are not clean, the hygiene is not maintained, then from there in a retrograde fashion, it can go and affect the gland itself. And that is what has caused this abscess. And what is the development of the parotid? The development of the parotid is ectodermal. So that makes things even more worse and it is seen on the outside through the skin, the swelling. Okay, now let's see. Hey Liam Plex, it's nice to see you watching from Karachi. It's really a surprise that I have students watching from different places. Very nice to see you and do keep watching all my classes and um, it's really nice. Good feeling. Okay, so now here parotid gland clinical note. So here we have the clinical note and what do you think? Now there is this ear and the parotid gland has been excised and you can see this is the parenchyma of the gland and it has to be excised in two portions, the superficial and the deeper one. Because within the parotid gland, you have a lot of important structures like you have the external carotid artery and its branches like you have maxillary artery and you have superficial temporal artery inside the parotid gland. Then you have retromandibular vein formation and you also see the facial nerve with its branches. You can see the plexus of vessels. You can see within the gland and you can also see the branches are in geopardy during the surgery. So because of the tug and pull, you can see that it doesn't look like it is aligned. It looks as if it is out of its shape because the parotid gland has been, you know, um, excised. So you can see this is the parotidectomy. About 80% of the salivary gland tumors occur in the parotid itself. There is submandibular and sublingual, but those two are more prone to the stones, but the parotid is more prone to the tumors and also to the abscess. All right, then there is an important step in the parotidectomy that has to be remembered that is identification, dissection, isolation and very, very important is preservation of the facial nerve. The facial nerve has to be preserved, otherwise it can lead to the Bell's palsy. All right, so that is one thing to remember. All right, what else we have? Superior sagittal sinus thrombosis. Superior sagittal sinus is present within that sulcus and you know that the bacterial infarction in the superior sinus thrombosis, you can identify the most frequently thrombosed vein is the superior sagittal sinus. And here 75% of the cases it happens and abnormalities are parasagittal and frequently bilateral. And you can also see some hemorrhage in 60% of the cases here as well, you can see the hemorrhage and on the left bilateral parasagittal edema, you can see and also you can see a lot of hemorrhage with the thrombosis of the superior sagittal sinus. So in this particular picture, you can see the hemorrhage, you can see everything is like, you know, darker in shade. So that indicates it. So. Next, you have an applied aspect. Let's see what is this of. You have the veins of the face which are connected with the cavernous sinus. Now, you know that there is this facial vein. Okay, so now you know it drains into deep facial vein. So, this is the second step. It comes here. Then from there, where does it go? It goes to the pterygoid plexus of veins. This is part three. So, from facial to deep facial to pterygoid plexus of veins and from there you can see that it drains into the cavernous sinus. So you can see there is this cavernous sinus and it has communication with the cavernous sinus. So this is the number four. So this is one route of transfer of infection if any from the facial vein. So facial vein drains this area 
that is called the dangerous area. And that's how the infection can spread. Okay, that is one route. Other route is through the trochlear, orbital and ophthalmic veins. Through this also the infection can spread to the cavernous sinus. So that is route two. So this is what happens in case of the thrombosis of the cavernous sinus. All right, let's see some more. And here we have the pituitary gland. Pituitary gland, surgical anatomy. If you look at, you can see there are pituitary tumors you can see. This is the pituitary tumor. And you know that most of the tumors, it can be removed surgically transspinoidally. So you have the spinoid bone, which is got this weaker region. You know, through the nasal cavity, it can be approached. There is a recess called spinoethmoidal recess. Spinoethmoidal recess, and through that it can be approached. And the approach is through nose cell, nose and the spinoethmoidal recess, and then going to the spinoidal air sinus. So, this is the route you can identify the air sinus. You can also see the parts of the spinoidal, you know, body of the spinoid. You have cella tersica where the pituitary gland is lodged. So you have this pituitary gland right in the center. Okay. So here you have bilateral tonsils are uniformly enlarged and red. Now you have this tonsils. This is the tonsil. And this is also the tonsil bilaterally. Both of them are enlarged. Okay, so now when it is enlarged like this, it could be because of the inflammation that is called the tonsillitis. Tonsillitis and you can see that there is a bilateral enlargement and you can also imagine how difficult it would be for the person to swallow. So you would also have dysphagia. And you can see there is this, if there is, this is the medial surface, this is the lateral surface which is sitting on the bed that is called the tonsillar bed. This is the medial surface which would have all these, you know, pits. They are called tonsillar crypts. These are called the tonsillar crypts. And any food lodged here can also result in, you know, over a period of time, if the dental hygiene is not good, it can also result in inflammation because of the formation of the candida. Candida bacteria can just grow and, you know, make this region look milky white. And it can also grow at the back of the tongue. All right. So this is called halitosis. So all this could happen, Quincy, halitosis, all these are some of the associated, you know, applied aspects with the tonsil. And in this one, you can see the tonsil is bilaterally enlarged and it has to be removed and the procedure is known as tonsillectomy. And when you do the tonsillectomy, the knowledge of blood supply is very important because it has very rich blood supply. And also, the person should know what are the structures at the tonsillar bed. Okay, next one we have a swelling that we can see near the wrist region. Okay, there is a swelling here. This is the thumb side, that is the little finger side. And what is this one? This is a swelling and let's see what it is. It is a cyst of the wrist. It is called ganglionic cyst of the wrist and it is a fluid filled sac and that forms between the wrist bones. There are wrist bones, there are uh, carpal bones and there is radius and the ulna and the gap between them can get filled with the sac of fluid that is synovial fluid. So it acts like a lump under the skin and it may also gradually you know, get bigger and bigger and you may feel pain and tingling in this region and this can cause lot of nuisance but 
the condition, you know, why it happened is unknown. That means etiology is not very well understood. And most often it happens in women between the age of 15 to 40 years of age. And also it needs to be drained. And that's why you have to visit the clinic. Okay, now here in this condition, you can see that there is something wrong with this wrist. What is wrong with the wrist? It is dropped, right? You can see that it is dropped. It is not X. Extended, it is dropped. So you can see that it has gone in this direction and this is straight. So what is wrong with the thing? All the extensors present here are the responsible tendons. So extensors do not extend the wrist joint. And what are they supplied by? They're all supplied by radial nerve. And this radial nerve, no damage can result in loss of extension of the wrist and that is known as that is known as wrist drop okay next one wrist drop and finger drop are the characteristics of injuries to the radial nerve within the spiral groove now here the brachioradialis muscle may be very weak and its tendon reflex is also lost there is sensory disturbances are there but are restricted to the back of the hand near the base of the thumb only. Now, with the wrist dropped, a flag, a fist like this is made and it, it is very difficult to make a fist and keep it extended. So, it just drops down but the fingers are all, you know, flexed and they are all not weak because the fingers are all supplied by the alpha nerve. So they are fine. Only the wrist joint is weak and dropped. All right. The next one, if you look at the next one, you can see that there is a swelling at the elbow. So here you, it is neither at the medial epicondyle nor at the lateral epicondyle. So it is right in the center. Here you can see it is right in the center at the elbow. And what do you think here it is? It is the bursae. It's the bursae that has been inflamed and it is called bursitis. It is also called the student's elbow. It's called student's elbow. And here you can see that prolonged pressure, you know, on this bursae can result in lot of inflammation and lot of pressure on those muscles. So you have, what muscles do you have? You have the triceps and it is well protected by the Bursa. So you have a bursa. That bursa is what is making the entire region swell up. And it could also be inflamed and that has to be checked and that is known as student's elbow. All right. So with all this, let's move on to the next one. So here we have the thyroid tissue, the accessory thyroid tissue is right in the center. And here you have the thyroid gland with its upper pole. There is this broad lower pole, there is this upper and you can also identify the thyroid artery which divides into anterior and posterior branches. This is the superior thyroid artery which is given by the, this is the common carotid and this is the external carotid and the other one is internal carotid. So this one is called the internal jugular vein and this is the left lobe of the thyroid. Next you have the blood supply that you can identify. You have the external carotid artery and this is the first branch of the external carotid, superior thyroid artery. Then you have this other branches are present from the external carotid which is not shown but here exclusively you can see the supply of the thyroid gland. There is inferior thyroid artery and you also have the third artery that supplies the isthmus alone that is called thyroidema. And you also see the middle thyroid vein, inferior thyroid vein and superior thyroid vein. They all drain into the internal jugular vein. Okay, that is the supply of the thyroid gland. All right, so now here there is a section that is called the sagittal section where you can identify the cerebellum, 
you can see the pons, you can see medulla oblongata, you can see the muscles at the back that is called suboccipital muscles, and you can see the odontoid process, and you can see the tubal tonsil, which has got this opening of auditory tube. And this is the soft palate, this is the hard palate, and the tongue, which has the genioglosses, and this is the geniohyoid, and you can also identify the nasal septum, the tonsil, lingual tonsil, the epiglottis. This is the vocal cord, which is also called the sinus of larynx. And this is trachea, tracheal rings. And here is the esophagus. These are the structures that you can identify. And here, of course, you have the other structures like you have all those air sinuses. You can see the sphenoidal air sinus here. And this one is the dangerous area of the face. Dangerous area of the face includes the philtrum side of the nose and you can also see the nose area. So this is the dangerous area of the face where the flow of blood in all the tributaries and communications are reversible as they possess no wall. So any Blood, you know, moving from this can also spread that infection throughout because they don't have any valves. They are valveless. And spread of infection can lead to thrombosis of the cavernous sinus because these are communicated with the cavernous sinus ultimately. And the communications with the dangerous area of the face can happen with two routes. One is through superior ophthalmic vein, another one is through the deep facial, then to pterygoid plexus of veins, and from there to the cavernous sinus through the emissary vein. Next, coming to the torticollis. What is this torticollis? That is also called the right neck. Here, what happens is the sternocleidomastoid muscle could be congenitally very short compared to the opposite side. So the short muscle is going to cause the person to have a head that is tilted towards the affected side. And that is also going to hamper the movement of the neck. That when the one side of the neck tilts, the head turns to the opposite side. And this side contracts, the head turns to the opposite side. So when both of them contract, you can lift your head off the Below. So, all that can happen and that movement will be affected. And sternocleidomastoid is supplied by the nerve, that is spinal accessory. Now, here coming to the next one, that is called the phrase syndrome. Phrase syndrome is a syndrome where the person would sweat whenever he secretes saliva or whenever he salivates, he would also sweat. And this is because there is a connection between the auricular temporal and great auricular nerves. And this communication you know, develops between these two things and that is what causes the phrase syndrome. And phrase syndrome happens in those who have already gotten a parotidectomy. So here, whenever there is a gustatory stimuli, in response to gustatory stimuli, the parotid gland will secrete saliva. At the same time, the greater auricular nerve that supplies those sweat glands will also start sweating. 
So when this happens, it is known as Frey syndrome. Usually there is no communication between them. So only in case of parotidectomy, when the regeneration of the nerve takes place, it can also communicate with these two and then it can result in such a condition. All right, so now this is another one where you can see the Bell's palsy, which is the infranuclear lesion. Infranuclear lesion where you can see there is a palsy of all those muscles that supplied by the facial nerve. The facial nerve supplies all those muscles and all that is affected because of the lesion in the facial nerve. Sometimes the herpes zoster, herpes zoster can also cause the infection of the geniculate ganglion. So it can be affected by virus also and this lesion can happen anywhere. So facial nerve lesion that is beyond the stylomastoid foramen and beyond the anterior horn of the spinal cord can result in intranuclear lesions and that is one of the reasons for having the symptom, symptomatous, you know, um, the thing appearance that is loss of movement on the same side or the ipsilateral side of the facial now being affected that is called Bell's palsy. All right. So with all this, I would like to mention that my referral code is ROHINI10 and with this code, you can earn 10% discount. Please note, you can earn 10% discount and you. this is very important for you because when you are, you know, looking at finest, you know, one of the finest academy and finest platforms, you have to remember that you are also eligible for the good discount whenever you have used the referral code RYHINI10. And you also have the Telegram channel that you can join. A Telegram channel will allow you to have access to all those educators and all those PDF notes that they put up. And you can also see that there are iconic and plus classes. Iconic classes are those which also comes with your prep ladder. And there is also plus classes which completely has an academy access. So you have prep ladder access plus the an academy access in case of iconic, and you have only the an academy access in case of plus classes. So this is going to be really nice when you get a 10% discount. So you can go with this 10% discount when you have the access or unlock the code or ni 10 All right, you, if you have any doubts or questions, you can always clip that doubt and you can send it to your educator and they would clarify it. So that is one option that you have here. And you also have so many special classes that you can look at. And there are special class features that is really different from YouTube classes where here you have a lot of interactive classes. But in the YouTube classes, that kind of interaction is not possible. So that is the main highlight of the special class, interaction. And you can also see that the, le the lecture notes are available, but that is not possible in case of YouTube classes because you can download them here in the special classes in the form of PDF. And every subscription has different steps. So here is the subscription steps you have to go to the section after you have downloaded the app and then you can go to the learning preferences what you want and then go check out how many months subscription you are looking at and then you can go for payment and this is the app that you can look at an academy learners app you can get it from play store you can get it from app store as well and there is Bucks Bounty. And if you think something is inappropriate, not according to, you know, your learning uh, pattern, if it is anatomy, if it is not anatomy, what you're getting, then you can definitely report it. And this is called Bucks Bounty. And subscribe and like and share is what we urge you to do. And you also get this PDF notes at the end of the class in case of special class only. But right now you are in YouTube, so you may not get. So please join all my special classes through the Learners app. 
So once you join these special classes, you are more interactive and we are interacting even better. So this is plus subscription. You have like that iconic subscription. You have many, many badges happening at the same time, like FMG badge, Target Next, Neat PG, etc. And you also have one month package that we have from 11th August to 9th September. And then you also have many 25,000 high yielding clinical questions based uh, things ready for you. Because when you want to discuss the subject, you definitely want to have a set of questions through which you can access your studies. And then you also have a scholarship test, which is, you know, of 50 questions for one hour. It is on 14th of August. And then you have subscriptions for the boost your medical PG preparation and four year subscription. If you are in UG and you want to prepare yourself for PG. And there is also EMI option in case you want to, that is 1250 per month. And there is also 1406 per month. And this is with the iconic and the plus subscription. So you can go with this and this is for 48 months. Okay, so you can go with this and look at the price. It is slightly higher on the iconic because you also get the prep ladder access. And all this you can get with the unlock code Rohini. And here is a grand test series that you can see from 4th August till 11th of September. And you can also see that Med Genius scholarship tests are available. And then we can always head forward to various other sections. So with all this, I would just like to stop at this and then, you know, head with other things in the next session that we are going to have at 7 p.m. So please join me at 7 p.m. for more image-based learning. So when you have something to look forward to, we get even more motivated. So please see me at 7 p.m. with more image-based learning and see you all very soon in an hour or two.